live at the Ministry of Energy in South Sea, continuing this conversation of the Africa Climate Summit. The main conversations that President William Bruto is leading at KCC focuses on the solutions for the larger context, uh, the larger context of Africa. But the discussion we're going to have here is energy specific. What are the climate needs for the energy industry and what solutions exist and how can we build the adaptive capacity of the energy industry so that it doesn't suffer the impact of climate change. My name is Zena Bondati and, I'm leading, and I'll be leading this discussion for the next one and a half hours. You can engage with us on social media at NTV Kenya at Zain Wandati, at, that's Z-E-Y-N Wandati and the hashtag to use is SCS23. Uh, this conversation, of course, the minister for the, the, the Ministry of Energy are our host today. So the CS himself is on this panel, CS Davis Churchill. Thank you for inviting us today. Uh, we also have um, engineer Joseph Siror, who is the CEO of Kenya Power, CEO and MD, Kenya Power. Kenyans have been wanting to know why we were left in the dark for more than a day. So he'll be telling us why that happened and if if it's ever going to happen again. Um, and we also have right next to me here, we have Eric Fanstrom, uh, who is from the World Bank and his area of specialization is energy and extractives. And last but not least, the Kenya Association of Manufacturers represented by the chairman himself, Rajan Shah. And he can tell us how that blackout affected the manufacturers. In fact, it's very good that you're sitting right next to Kenya Power. <laughs> So maybe if you need to throw a punch, <laughs> he's literally right there. So maybe I could start with you, Mr. Shah. How are you affected by that blackout as manufacturers? Th thank you, Zainab, and good evening to the viewers. And I, I don't desire to throw a punch at my good friend here. <laughs> uh, but yes, uh, of course, any form of blackout or interruption uh, in, in power uh, uh, directly does impact manufacturers because... Uh, in, in the process, uh, if, if you have such interruptions, it's, it actually, uh, at for many processes, it actually even leads to losses of uh, product uh, midstream. Um, the more important thing is that uh, I think there, there is a much stronger relationship we have built with the Kenya Power, and, and there's better communication which happens, and we have actually developed a very strong WhatsApp groups at even the at the lower levels uh, where uh, our our manufacturers and their teams are all the constantly engaging uh, with Kenya Power. So uh, it was, yes, unfortunate. Uh, and of course, uh, we will uh, jointly have to kind of work through and find solutions around it. But uh, I believe he, he will probably be able to be better answer. But yes, there is always a negative impact. Thank you. You're saying you're friends with Kenya Power, but an increasing number of views running away from the grid. And, and installing your own solar panels. Well, that <laughs> I, I think I believe that's true, and in fact, that's why we are here today. Mm. That how can we also uh, uh, develop our green growth in energy? Uh, but I, 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 the conversation of energy efficiency started uh, 14, uh, 17 years ago. Mm. Uh, we house uh, the Center for Energy Efficiency and Conservation, and this is a public-private partnership. Uh, between uh, the Ministry of Energy and, and Kenya Association of Manufacturers. And, and, and one of the objectives was how we can improve efficiency of power usage. And, and, uh, and over the 17 years, we have jointly kind of worked together, of course, funded by the Ministry of Energy. And this is going to how we can become globally competitive. Mm. So irrespective of, uh, of course, power tariffs have also been going up, which is also not good news for manufacturers. But this also m encourages us to become more efficient in the power usage. And by becoming more efficient, I think we are also uh, at, at the same time uh, alluding to the climate change and mm. how we actually become uh, greener manufacturers. Yeah, and it had nothing to do with the unreliability of power, your transition to green energy, to the solar panels, had nothing to do with the unreliability of power. He's looking at you very keenly, by the way. No, no, of course. Uh, look, I, I think we are having here honest conversations. And yes, there has, I mean, of course, it all started because of cost of power and unreliability of power. Mm. That's where we started off. But what we are seeing out of this whole initiative is that we are also kind of fitting in very well into the green energy space as well. 
and 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 yes, uh, and uh, manufacturers are more and more installing solar capacities. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, the payback period for many of these investments is becoming lower as yeah. the power tariffs are high. Yes. So uh, I believe uh, it, it's 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 beneficial for manufacturers. But when the power tariffs are low, and I, I believe we are going to have these conversations, how do we make those investments still feasible and viable? Yes. Engineer Cyril, we've had the, Kenya, uh, the manufacturers saying the challenges they had with the blackout. So maybe you could tell us why were we in the dark for more than a day? Thank you so much, sign up. One of the things I really want to commend the government over the last few years is the ambitious growth in terms of the number of users we are connected. And in, of course, taking that very bold step, expanding the network so rapidly to meet and to provide energy to each and every person who really needs to be connected, at times when you have a very rapid expansion, there is the risk that some of the things you also need to look at can not say overlook as such, mm. but you may not invest as much in those areas that you would actually require to. Mm. So, there have been a number of generations which have been coming on stream. There have been also a number of transmission lines which have been extended, a number of medium voltage lines. And the more expansive a network is, the more possibly a small thing can actually lead to a cascade of failures. Mm. Of course, the underside, or rather, one of the options could be you remain small and then you are stable. But it takes somebody very bold to say no. Let's expand very rapidly and start dealing with any challenge that does arise by virtue of that expansion. We are very much aware there was a challenge in one of the areas of the country where a plant tripped. And at the time of the tripping, it was carrying a large um, percentage of power. Yeah. Ordinarily, we have schemes that actually are there to address any interruption. And um, possibly just for the sake of the audience, when we are running the plants to meet the demand, we do have what is called spinning reserves. Spinning reserves are the reserves that especially are there to take care of any interruption that could come as a result of either a plant going down or even the variable energy resources, which by their nature keep varying. I'm talking about your wind and solar. Uh, one time you can be having maximum in solar, a cloud cover just comes and it covers everything. So to mitigate against such, we do have plants that just run and are waiting and are monitoring what is happening in terms of what is supplying the demand. And it will keep varying. If, if the solar, for example, drops, another generation will have to rise up to meet the drop that has resulted. And it keeps following in that manner. Mm -hmm. Now, when what you lose is so substantial, at times the system is unable to deal with. Mm -hmm. But if it is a bit to a particular degree, we have what is called levels of load shedding, where possibly it drops by 3 or 4%. It will know that now what is being generated and the spinning reserves cannot meet that demand. So what it will do, it will disconnect part of the loads within the system so that the demand then matches the generation. Mm -hmm. But where you lose a very substantial portion, then the speed with which even the equipment can respond in terms of raising the generation or even dropping some of the load cannot be mitigated. And that is actually what leads to a cascade of failures. Mm -hmm. But out of it, sign up. And we really regret that it did happen. There are lessons, definitely, you always learn. And it also reveals areas of the network that are weak. Mm -hmm. And we are already looking into it. Mm -hmm. We have invested a lot. A number of engineers have really looked into it. And we are looking at all areas that require immediate action to mitigate whether it becomes setting or, ex or undertaking certain interventions. Mm -hmm. So as we go forward, we are getting stronger and stronger in terms of dealing with the challenges that befall us. But mm -hmm. as Kenya Power, we are really your partners to battle darkness. You are partner in battling <laughs> darkness, but using green energy resources. <laughs> We have a lot of green energy resources, but still, we, we suffer consistent and reliability of power, and we'll still talk some more about that. Waziri, why did it take so long to fix that problem? Um, uh, thank you, Sainap, and uh, welcome to uh, this uh, town hall, and thank you for bringing us together at this time when we are hosting the world in Nairobi, Kenya, uh, to talk about climate change issues and uh, what we're going to do to secure uh, the Earth, and thank you for the Earthwise uh, series that has been running to basically 
uh, showcase what we are doing in our country. Um, the blackout that uh, hit us on one Friday at 9.45, like you've asked, I'll be very straight. It took long to bring it up because it happened uh, when the Lord uh, uptake for the country was very low. Mm. And therefore, as we brought up the network and I went personally to the control center with the PS, uh, what happened is uh, two things. It was beginning, the load was coming down significantly because we were beginning to sleep uh, in the evening. That is the peak hour, it was coming down. And secondly, the net, the inter connection to Uganda was down because some um, towers on the Uganda side had uh, been down for a while and there was no uh, interconnection with Uganda. Mm. So we were not able to do what you call a black start. Uh, that is a feed, you, you know, to put it in the layman language that you will understand as Kenyans. Sometimes when your battery is very low in the car, you, you jump start. Mm. So we needed to jump start our country, but we didn't have Uganda to help us to jump start. And that is done all the time. It is built into the BPPA, the Power Purchase Agreement. Mm. And because we were down, we had to find ways of starting uh, using our own system, which was already down. The second one was, when you're starting a system which has gone down, and because you do what you call synchronization of load against supply, you bring up systems and you make sure that load which you have, that supply which you have fed in is being taken, uh, there's a load. And so you bring it up slowly, and uh, because most of the load centers were asleep, mm -hmm. uh, it became difficult to, we had to load very slowly to ensure that we brought the system up um, successfully. But those are the two challenges that uh, we faced, and we've learned that uh, maybe we should not have um, uh, a PPA, one PPA out of Uganda which can jumpstart us, because we also do jumpstart them. They use us to start their system when they're down. Mm -hmm. We should possibly be signing shortly with Tanzania so that we can have an alternative uh, feedback or a, a back feed which can help us to start and we can also help them to start when they are down. So Ideally, how long should it take to fix? Ordinarily, uh, we looked at, uh, and we've been to Parliament to explain to Kenyans what happened. Most We looked at the historical uh, uh, downtimes which we've had and it has taken between 45 minutes to start um, the one zone of the country and bring up the whole country a maximum of two to three hours. You'll also appreciate the fact that uh, they are picking powers like diesel plants which start very quickly. There are plants like um, geothermal which really take a lot of time because uh, once they are down to build up the steam to the quality level before you feed into the turbine uh, takes time. So, uh, yes, it, it should take anything between uh, an hour to two, three hours. This one took extraordinarily long. Mm. And you've learned from it. And we've learned some lessons. Can you guarantee Kenyans it will never happen again? Uh, you know, accidents happen, but we learn all the time and uh, we try to mitigate the challenges so that it doesn't happen again. Mm. Uh, don't forget, we've just hosted the whole world in Nairobi and you've not seen Africa. <laughs> so we've been and very we careful, we've, we've learned our lessons, mm. uh, we've had to basically sometimes take off the commercial side and check whether the, the, gener the generators which are owned by the, uh, by the customers are also able to take off, like you, d you did realize that the airport was not able to take off. Mm. So we did do a good audit in our networks to ensure that the guests in Nairobi were not going to experience something that could embarrass us. And, and yes, as we go forward, it's not only that. I'm sure even people like Safaricom may not have had revenue the following day because all our mobile phones were not charged. Yes. Um, <laughs> systems, every, everything uses power today. Mm. And, and so it, it's a lesson that really uh, Rajan Shah has talked to industry and the kind of losses that can really take the country down in a day a day out of power is really expensive for the economy. Mm. So we will endeavor to ensure that from the lessons learned, we do take mitigation measures that will ensure that such a thing does not happen again. Mm. 
Eric, uh, we've seen the impacts of climate in the energy industry in Kenya. And uh, I did spend some time with the CS a couple of days ago just documenting some of those impacts. And we saw how low the dams were right now because of uh, losing, the, they're missing about 15 meters of water right now. And so they're not able to produce um, electricity at optimum capacity. What are some of the climate impacts you've seen around the world from where you sit as, as uh, the World Bank? Thank you, Zainab. Uh, and first of all, great to be here. Thanks for having me. And uh, uh, we've been really uh, admiring the wonderful hosting of the ACS. I think in truly every guest to Kenya has been enjoying themselves at the conference uh, this week. So uh, we're truly grateful. Now, climate change is real. Climate change happens in different way in different parts of the globe. And even when we look at East Africa, um, I saw actually Kenya Meteorological Service came out a couple of days ago with, uh, with some forecasting for the, for the short rains. You can see that uh, for different uh, impacts like El Nino, we are supposedly getting more rain. Mm -hmm. um, some of the other impacts, uh, we're getting less. We see that uh, the eastern part of the Horn of Africa has been dry for many years and suffering hugely from... from uh, from drought while the western part of the same region are suffering floods. So climate is, you can say, emphasizing and aggravating things that are already happening with the weather, right? Mm -hmm. And it's, it's, you know, it's not that everybody gets drier. Some get, you know, get wetter weather. Some get drier weather. We're getting trouble with some of the equipment in the network that overheats uh, or, or, uh, or otherwise affects. So I think that what we tr try to recommend for energy systems to be more resilient, mm. uh, link up with neighbors, have more ability to trade power, make the network more robust, because you're going to need it going forward. Mm. Um, just to ask you, the energy industry itself has been accused as being one of the key drivers the fossil fuels, the extractives industry itself has also been accused of, of impacting negatively on biodiversity. How can you then talk about um, greening energy when we are not addressing the root cause of the problem, which is the fossil fuels and the impacts on biodiversity? Well, first of all, I think uh, we should not single out the energy industry. We all probably got to work today in a car, in a bus, I think most of us didn't walk. So, uh, so we are all part of an energy system, right? And that energy system, and that is what is called the energy transition, need to transition from a dependency on a fossil fuels, from petrol, from diesel, to, let's say, electric cars, to uh, uh, greener uh, versions. And we also need to be a lot better at conservation. And I think there, I mean, Kenya is certainly a leader in Africa in, in uh, making sure that we protect the environment. We could do better. Though. <laughs> Engineer Cyril, if I come back to you, we've seen the, um, the impacts of climate change from the production side and how the production side is trying to address that. Have you seen it from the distribution side, which is uh, the distrib you sit on the distribution end of the chain? Have you seen any impacts on the distribution end? Yeah, definitely. We've, if you look at them, even over the past few years, We've had challenges of towers collapsing or parts, you know, uh, or even poles falling and all that kind of thing. So those are really some of the effects that we, we have experienced and we have seen happening out there by virtue of these uh, climate change issues. Mm -hmm. uh, from the manufacturing perspective, the solar panels that you're installing are already a solution for you. And uh, you've mentioned the unreliability of power, so you're doing the, the, the solar. What, what is the cost implication of doing that? Because there's always that concern that you're pushing people to do solar, but the cost of doing it, you might as well just stay on the grid. Is that what you're experiencing yourselves? So, so thanks. Uh, that's a very good question. I think uh, what, uh, of course, the initial investment cost of any solar installation is high, but we have seen over the years, last few years, that it has significantly been coming down. Uh, and obviously, the other, uh, the other aspect which uh, has, uh, contributes to uh, somebody making a decision on whether they want to go for a solar investment is the payback, 
if you are if you are uh, generating your own solar power, then you are saving on Kenya power. Right now, with the high tariffs, it actually the inter the payback period significantly reduces. So, uh, from 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 uh, investment point of view, right now, I think manufacturers find it quite attractive uh, mm -hmm. to invest in solar, uh, and there are financing solutions as well. Uh, which are available. Uh, the suppliers of uh, many of these alternative powers are giving good solutions, even they're giving solutions where they're coming and putting those panels and you pay as you go and use as well. So there are some very creative uh, solutions. But I must say that I think even the government uh, through the ministry is also supporting mm. uh, in, this, uh, in this initiative. Uh, and I'm glad to say that, look, I think installations which are over one megawatt, I believe that we are at the tail end of the regulations that to introduce net metering so that any excess that uh, will be produced from this uh, solar installations will be able to be taken back into the grid as well. Mm. So I think that's a, a, a very positive kind of policy direction, mm. uh, which is encouraging. So w I would honestly like to thank the ministry and the government uh, on that initiative. Thank you. Are you being nice because the CS is sitting next to you? Uh, not at all. We, 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 to be honest, uh, Zena, we actually have very honest conversations and, 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 and it's, it's not being, but where credit is due, we also have to give where credit is due as well. Mm -hmm. yes. Okay. Uh, Waziri, I know you, the ministry is looking forward and hoping that an El Nino happens so that you re replenish the, the, the missing water in the dams. But today you also launched a hydrogen strategy. Tell us a little bit about that strategy. What is it and what's in it and what is it trying to do? Uh, even as I do that, let me reiterate what Rajan just said uh, regarding the net metering regulations, which are at the tail end. Um, sign up the generation of energy that happens when you install your solar, uh, really, uh, in a way, Though a customer could be walking away from Kenya Power, today we are not yet seeing um, the peak. The peak hour continues rising. The highest amount of uh, megawatt hours, megawatt that we use in a day at an hour like this, when all our homes are lit, continues rising. So there's still growth in the demand for power, uh, and I can assure you, the net metering regulation is one which is captured in the Energy Act. Uh, including uh, whaling, whaling uh, uh, regulations, which will allow uh, Rajan to develop his one megawatt plant. Uh, and if he has excess power, he can also transport that power to another industry out of the location where he operates from. So it, it, it only helps to build on uh, the renewable energy. But more importantly, yes, we, we really need to do something to ensure we improve on the availability and reliability of our energy. As regarding uh, the issue of uh, green hydrogen, green hydrogen is a, a frontier development that uh, really is going to change the way we develop and consume power. When I did say earlier that uh, the, there is need to synchronize demand to supply, if you generate too much power sign up, somebody has to pay for it. Mm. Because all the power that is generated by KenGen and all the IPPs uh, is taken by Kenya Power. And um, for example, we generate about 12,000 gigawatt hours in a year, uh, but we only sell 9,000. We lose some 22%. But that 22% that is lost is still paid for because the generator has to be paid for what they generate. Mm. So to a very good extent, if we don't sell that power, including what you had uh, Dr. Siror called spinning reserves, uh, if it is not of taken, it is still paid for. What we lose in the transmission network is paid for. And so we try, we develop power on a least cost uh, framework, least cost power development plan, which seeks to really match the demand the supply to the demand. So we don't generate too much. Uh, we generate just about enough to, to, to meet the demand. But green hydrogen today is uh, really uh, breaking the class ceiling in that you can have so much power, like now when we go to sleep, the geothermals are still running, and take that power to green hydrogen. You take it to run some electrolyzers, which splits water. Water is H2O. 
uh, and gives us hydrogen and releases oxygen. The hydrogen is a form of energy that can be used to run uh, the industry from mobility industry to power generation. It is transportable, it is power commodities. You don't have to transport it using a transmission network. You can transport it by road, you can transport it by sea, and it is 100% green. The important thing about green hydrogen is that uh, you can also, for our country, which is an agricultural economy, we can attach a nitrogen uh, through some chemical process mm. and create ammonia and take it to fertilizer mm. and be able to produce our own uh, fertilizer to support the agricultural economy. And you do know that today we expense uh, forex or foreign currency to bring in fertilizers into our country. The other important thing is because it's transportable, we can also then accelerate the availability of this energy across the, uh, the country. We can service and green the world because like I said, it's power commoditized, but more importantly, we can run our immobility. E um, of course, you cannot run immobility e directly through the battery storage and expire or reduce the use of uh, fossil fuel, which uh, I don't know whether you'll ask that, but we spend 500 million US dollars today to bring in petroleum products to run our economy, uh, which really also does not help very much in climate change. Mm. And therefore, we can secure our forex uh, requirements for the country by not having to import petroleum products, but using our solar, our wind, and our geothermal in form of um, energy for EV, but more importantly, as green hydrogen that we can also export to other markets. Let me ask you, this green hydrogen, when you're transporting it, in what form are you transporting it? Um, because it of gas the... gas or a liquid? Are you transporting it as a gas or a liquid? What, what you want to do, you, you, because uh, if you transport gas, you transport very little. So you sometimes have to liquefy to be able to transport so much. Mm -hmm. And then you regasify it um, on the other end. So those technologies are being developed. There's also security of transporting uh, hydrogen, which is in the final phase of development, mm. uh, developing um, uh, systems to transport hydrogen through the waters and, and, and be able to take it to market. But yes, there's so much development happening in that front. And I want to confirm that Kenya is not being left behind because uh, you are aware that, like I said at night, we don't use so much power. And the geothermal that is already available to us, mm -hmm. we can be able to sell at a discount price mm. and run those electrolyzers for the concessionaires who are willing to develop green hydrogen, go to fertilizer or ammonia, and we can take that ammonia as an agricultural economy. So when I'm going to use that hydrogen for mobility, in what form am I using it? Instead of having the petrol tank, you'll have a hydrogen that tank in your car. Gas? Yes. You'll have a hydrogen tank in your car. Just like you have seen vehicles today which also run on uh, LPG. LPG. Mm. So instead of, you'll go to a gas station and we'll fill your tank with hydrogen, green hydrogen. Mm. And I, we say green hydrogen because there can be gray hydrogen. The point, the differentiator here because uh, at a time like Africa Climate Summit, there's, there's hydrogen today in the industry, but hydrogen which is developed using fossil fuel. So you'll have polluted the environment to generate gray or dirty or whatever. But what we are talking about here is you are using renewable energy to develop green hydrogen. Mm. So the difference, there is hydrogen in the industry today, mm. but it is not hydrogen which is developed using a, a, a clean process. And then so we are also looking at the cost economics of green hydrogen because uh, if the economics don't add up, it will be a challenge. And that is where the debate is today. Mm. Okay. Um, when you talk about de-risking uh, de the, the energy uh, industry uh, for wider participation, the energy industry itself is very capital intensive. And um, multilateral lender, lenders such as the World Bank have been accused, even here at this summit, yesterday there was a whole match to accuse multilateral lenders such as the World Bank for funding fossil fuel production on one end, and yet on the other end, talking about um, green transition and just transition, and oh my God, the global is warming, we need to do something about climate change. How, can, how do you, um, 
how is it possible to redirect this funding that you're spending so much on fossil fuels and redirect it to initiatives such as green hydrogen? Uh, Senab, first of all, we are already doing that. Um, so I think um, it's it's often po you know popular to bash the bank, but I, c I have the numbers. And in the last three years, uh, we have virtually funded no new uh, fossil fuel plants. We do some exceptions. If we have, let's say, a country under fragility that has no viable renewable resources, the impact on the climate from, uh, let's say, a, a poor uh, country in Africa from, uh, you know, some small fossil fuel use, uh, we feel that it's motivated and, you know, the first priority need to be the poor. But in terms of these large power plants that were the funding of, of, uh, of, of some years back, large coal plants, we are not really in that business anymore. And the most important thing is that it's not the cheapest. Mm. And as an institution driven by economists, we are always trying to seek the lowest cost because the lowest cost means the lowest tariff possible mm -hmm. uh, for the consumer. So solar uh, mixed with uh, stable renewables like hydro and geothermal, uh, wind where there's a good condition for that are the least costs, but it requires investments in the grid. We need to stabilize it and we need to make sure that we can use it well. So. Mm. Engineer, we need to take a break shortly, but before we do, Kenyans want to know if our energy, if our grid, the energy production is more than 90% green, why is the cost of power still so high? Thank you so much. And I think, thank you for appreciating that actually above 90%. At times up to 93, there are even times it really approaches 100%. But mm -hmm. when you average it out, it's about 93%. But yes, the cost of going green is at times substantially higher than the cost of the old, that is using fossil fuels. So I think one of the good things we would say is that the country was bold enough to even invest in green energy resources, which are substantially more expensive, but definitely uh, promotes the journey of going green. So in terms of looking at really the cost, one of the things that I did mention at the outset is that there has been an ambitious investment by the government in terms of extending the reach of power. When that happens, there is capital, and you have already alluded to, the fact of cap the, it's capital intensive. So all these capital intensive projects, whose timeline in terms of the benefits will actually go for many years to come. If you pick, for example, the link to Ethiopia, yes, we've spent about 50 billion shillings, or rather Ketrako has spent about 50 billion shillings, but that is a transmission line that will be used for many years to come. But that investment is what we are now feeling in terms of the tariff that is there. So yes, we may feel the pain right now when we are investing heavily, but the benefit of it is that we are securing our future and also avoiding situations where there would be massive load shedding. So I think the pain that we are, or somebody could feel that they are really feeling is more to do with addressing the future. But again, if you even compare our tariff with the rest of the world, you may again come to the conclusion that it may not really be that high because there are areas of the world where they pay 80 cents of a dollar per kilowatt hour, and we are not anywhere close to that. So yes, there is a cost, but the benefit is much more, and possibly the alternative would actually be worse. Thank you. We take a quick break, but when we come back, we'll go into the, some of the solutions being implemented on the ground, and of course, how uh, you as a Kenyan can be guaranteed, maybe by the gentleman here, if you were to come up with a uh, a mini grid by yourself or maybe learn how to generate energy by yourself. You know, we've had people who've been shut down because they generated the electricity in their backyard using the stream in their backyard. So what will that mean for you? And uh, we'll ask the CS to talk about the policy framework in that space, especially for the young innovators we have in the country. We'll be right back. Hi there, my name is George Washiri Optiven, and uh, we are very happy at Optiven introducing to you Achievers Paradise Gong. We are calling you to be part and parcel of the fastest growing satellite town in this city. Optiven is doing water reticulation, 
nice fence, tree planting, solar seat lighting, beautiful, well compacted marum roads, and uh, we are developing and building a beautiful Achievers Gate. This is a chance that you cannot afford to miss. Call this number 0790-300-300. Are you ready for a challenge that could change your life? Introducing hashtag Nation Scholarship Challenge. We all know that getting an education can be tough, but we also know that a scholarship can make a huge difference. That's why Nation Media Group and Goodwill are giving you the chance to win 80,000 Kenya shillings. All you need to do is to post a video telling us why you want this scholarship and how it will help you achieve your goals. Don't forget to use the hashtag Nation Scholarship in your post. It's super easy and by taking part, you'll be part of a global community of people who are all working towards their goals. So if you're thinking about pursuing higher education or have big career aspirations, this is your chance to take a step forward. Don't wait too long. Complete your Goodwill profile and share your story with us now. The Eldoret Technical Training Institute, ETTI, offers students an opportunity to explore their career growth in a unique and friendly learning environment. Now introducing the ETTI Driving School for All Driving Categories. Apply now. Eldoret Technical Training Institute. Growing reputation. Dream home for as low as 1.98 million Kenya shillings in Vipingo Kilifi. SMS Vipingo to 22365 or call us today on 0740-400-215. Terms and conditions apply. Welcome back. If you're just joining us, this is the National Leadership Forum live from the Ministry of Energy headquarters in Nairobi. And it is a spin-off conversation of the Africa Climate Summit talking about the impacts of climate change on the energy sector and the, how to build the adaptive capacity and the resilience of the energy sector going forward as we talk about just transition. And you can engage with us on social media. The hashtag is at NMG Leadership Forum, at NTV Kenya, at Zainu Andati, and at Nation Climate. Those are the hashtags you can engage with us on. You can ask your question to any of the panelists here, or you can share your thoughts and comments on the same. Now, Waziri, let's talk a little bit about the policy framework of the energy industry. The theme, at the Africa, one of the themes of the Africa Climate Summit, or maybe one of the key goals of the Africa Climate Summit, is to focus on the solutions, particularly homegrown solutions. We've seen so many Kenyans coming up with solutions within the energy industry. Young, young men uh, learning how to build turbines in their small streams and generating enough power to supply to at least two, three homes. And then as soon as somebody does that story or highlights that story, they're quickly shut down. How are you addressing such Kenyans who are becoming innovative in the space of energy? Um, uh, thank you, Senap. The innovators could range from technology innovators to financial innovators in terms of uh, how to look at refinancing uh, power projects, transmission projects, and so on and so forth. In the front of technology, uh, with the coming up of the net metering and the fact that we also do allow and license off-grid, there are solutions today uh, that are there and we would encourage homegrown solutions to help us to go to off-grid areas. You know, building a grid is expensive. Uh, engineer Sirot did mention about the interconnector between Ethiopia and Kenya, and uh, we spend a whopping 600 million US dollar to build that interconnection, mm. to be able to bring that power from Ethiopia. To be able to interconnect the country, particularly the difficult terrain, sometimes the cost benefit would really require us to build small off-grid uh, solutions that is a grid which supplies that local industry and does not connect to the main grid and then so because of the licensing framework with EPRA 
and the regulations that have been put in place. We are shortly finalizing the net metering and so that for even the other generators who could just buy uh, a generator in solar or wind and install it off grid or on grid, they are able to feed back uh, and do a net metering where they can sell when they're generating and use when they need to use. So uh, on the financial front, and, and we are going to sharpen that because uh, really uh, they, saw, they saw much of that today. Uh, on the financial side, we are beginning to look seriously into uh, financial models that could look at uh, PPP, PIP, privately initiated uh, uh, public partnership. We are looking at uh, even um, uh, refinancing, what do you call it, monetization of the built networks. Think about why do we have to own this 600 kilometer uh, Ethiopia Kenya link? It's a thousand kilometers. We don't have to own it 100%. We could own it jointly with you, with World Bank, and be able to unlock, uh, it's called um, asset recycling. Mm. We, we can be able to monetize 40% of that and release that revenue <coughs> to be able to invest and quickly open up other areas of the country which are not on the network. This would be innovation in terms of uh, financial reengineering and looking at the cost benefit so that the country does not lose it. Because sometimes your balance sheet is asset rich and, not, and yet it is not serving the economy. Mm. So uh, I want to encourage the innovators, like you said, uh, from social innovators to uh, financial innovators to technical innovators to really bring those ideas to EPRA, the licensing uh, body, or to us as the ministry, and we'll be able to encourage and see how we can open the country together. Uh, in the greening of the environment, and particularly uh, the retirement of the fossil fuel, which is not so significant in Kenya, because uh, like you've heard, we are 93% uh, uh, green today in terms of energy mix. Uh, the country, has a, we have undertaken to really be 100% green by 2030, and the scope of working with everybody who has got solutions to be able to bring in green uh, generation, but we'll be talking more into if we can get support on generation, if we can get support on transmission, and we'll be looking now, we are beginning to talk about green, green, green transmission, mm. so that when you are on certain network, you know you are 100% on green, green energy, mm. and be able to unlock what otherwise uh, uh, Dr. Mativo, who is 100%, the CEO for Ketraco is 100% funded by government, have that revenue, have that investment to go to other areas because we are able to unlock uh, through those uh, innovations uh, in financial structuring uh, the, the kind of investment that would otherwise go to building the infrastructure can be built by the private sector mm. and make money through willing. You've mentioned that these innovators can bring these solutions to the ministry, bring them to EPRA uh, for licensing and whatnot. But these young, same young people will say, the government will always tell you that, bring these solutions to, to the government or to the ministry. But there's no supportive framework for them because uh, the system is built in a way that Kama Ujuani, your story is a how. So how can you um, <laughs> how I, can you I, guarantee I, these young people that wakifika pale ministry how time boa brother ka ujum to your story how in a transition like we are going through climate change now and uh, like you said innovation you do know also that um, when we have solutions like power solutions they have to be safe mm. um, I can assure you even when uh, World Bank have partnered with us and built off grid solutions they are unable to collect the revenue. They will still need to partner with us to be able to use and establish framework systems to be able to collect the revenue. Mm. So there, there is need for partnership and certainly would like the country, you know, when you fly around the country and I've lately flown around with you, there are villages where if we do not allow the private sector, if we do not allow, allow, allow the innovators to put in local solutions, we may never reach those areas. Mm. And I can assure you, we're going to look at regulations and allow our young innovators to come up with homegrown solutions that can support us to 100% power 
and provide access to the country. Let, let me, me mention, let me mention mm. where we are today. Mm. Uh, between 2013 and 2022, we moved the country from 22% in terms of access to energy power to about 76, 75% today. And we did this through the last mile. The last mile was an innovation which has been borrowed and copied to many other countries. And even as we talked about uh, expensive tariffs today, what we may not be aware about is that we connect you to power without having to pay an entry fee and recover the connection fees slowly over time. That's why you, dis you see sometimes somebody saying, I bought tokens and I got so much because part of the token is going to repaying your connection fees. Mm. So th there'll be so much innovation. I want to encourage innovators and to encourage the young generation to help us to connect this country together. Mm. Are there any innovators from young Kenyans that the, the government has absorbed? Any solutions from young Kenyans that the government has absorbed? Are there any that you know of? Um, you'll also appreciate this is a, a capital intensive area mm. and we do have uh, you'll go to some village and find an innovator who has done a, wind, a windmill and servicing only two homes. Because by the time you are really building an off-grid to, to, to build up a network with those conductors and the pricing is, is not cheap. But maybe what we need, that's why I talked so much about partnership. We need to build partnership and support the innovators to be able to grow those local solutions into industrial solutions mm. uh, and bridge the capital challenge of having to, uh, you know when you talk about uh, connecting the country, uh, Ketraco today runs 7,000 kilometers, 7,000 kilometers of high voltage lines across the country. If you're going to build a solution for a village, even when you go to a village like the other day we were in a, a village in uh, Thana River there, and to connect that village, the amount of conductors that you use to reach the homes it's not so much innovation. You can have a solution to generate, but to be able to reach all the homes in a village is fairly capital intensive. So I want to encourage that we'll work with the innovators, look at the various solutions which are there. We've seen windmills uh, running. We've seen uh, uh, small solar solutions. And the industry is really developing fast today, and I want to encourage that. Uh, we'll work on our regulations. Mm -hmm. Any innovator with some interesting solutions come forward to the ministry, come forward to energy, uh, petroleum and regulatory authority, and we'll be able to support those innovations. Trust your gope. <laughs> Engineer, um, the, the minister, uh, the, the CS here has talked previously about the transition to electric mobility. And uh, the Kenyan Association of Manufacturers also raised concern about the unreliability of power. So if you're going to be having electric vehicles that require charging and our power supply is unreliable, how do you fit into that picture as Kenya Power? Thank you so much, sign up. I want actually to just notify the public that really in terms of our availability, we do measure the availability of our systems and they are, it's above 99%. I do know that we do have challenges in parts of the network which can give the perception that possibly they are not available. But I think from your home, I don't know, apart from the blackout that occurred the other day, I do not think really you've, possibly the whole of this month, you've had um, any interruption on your power. So we are partnering and we, re we really want to invite the um, consumers to move and to transit into the e-mobility space. The beauty of that movement, uh, Zainab, is that not only will that increase the sales of power. Because one of the things that happen, Zainab, even as the CS had said, is that we, we are selling about 10,000 gigawatt hours. And those 10,000 gigawatt hours are the ones which must answer to all the requirements of the electricity sector. I'm talking about generation, transmission, distribution, and retail. Now, where we have a situation, and indeed we have a lot of capacity, and that's actually why one of the uh, innovations that we did implement, of course, it's elsewhere, is the issue of the time of use, where we really want to drive the demand from 10 p.m., which substantially goes down. Now, when we have a situation where many people transit and we start using, uh, adopting immobility, then that would actually result in a much higher 
volume of cells, possibly 17,000 or even more, and that now will be the units that will answer to all the demands of the sector. So that is a win-win situation in one, on one angle from the aspect that now people will be leaving the fossils and moving into green energy. And like I said, if you look at our energy mix, 905 megawatts is actually from geothermal. You talk about 839 from hydro. You talk about 210 coming from solar and 435 coming from wind. If you look at that mix, of course, we still have thermal about 512 and a gas turbine at 60. But when you look at the mix and what is usually dispatched, you'll actually realize that we have a very high percentage of green. So if we have a transition where most of the car users move away from the fossils, not only will it enable the government to avoid the $500 million, which the ESPS alluded to as the money that was used for the purpose of fuels, but we are also going to be increasing the sales of uh, the, that is the amount of power that is sold, which can even allow possibly a revision of the tariff, and at the same time, it will be helping the government to move towards the 100% uh, green energy transition. So it has a lot of benefits from all sides. But in terms of availability, I think we can guarantee that our network, and like I did say, when there was the national blackout, there are lessons learned, and we are actually improving and even investing a lot in reinforcing our grid and strengthening it to answer to the demand that the consumers would have if on this journey of immobility. And likewise, even to e-cooking. Instead of using you know, the dirty fuels, we are also providing the e-cooking space where people can again use electricity to do their cooking. And by the way, I think we should have a demonstration from our team. Okay, They'll the actually prove to you. Expensive. No, it's not expensive. An have induction. you seen the cost of your tokens? Y no, but in terms of, <laughs> if you compare, you can actually cook it very with 20 shillings. With Where? only 20 shillings. No, I think you need to visit electricity house. <laughs> we have a whole demonstration of e-cooking, and they will prove to you, because even there is a meter which will actually be measuring the, the units, mm. and they will actually prove to you that it has been a perception, that idea of using electricity is a perception, rather than is more is expensive is a perception rather than the reality i think we are willing to prove to all our consumers that if you move and use induction cookers and the that transition not only will you have and even electric um, uh, pressure cookers they cook food and the test is really maintained i think you need to engage our team and indeed the consumers <laughs> we welcome them to no, that they can really have very tasty food. food cooking with electricity is not cheap no it is and we are willing to demonstrate that. <laughs> we are willing. <laughs> the cost of your tokens. You know, for a lot of people, they would actually rather buy charcoal and put that githeri on charcoal than to put it on a gas, on an electric cooker. Now, if you put electricity house, they will actually give you the comparison You're of buying the, the charcoal. As the no, they, they, have the, they have the maths. They will tell you you need this amount of charcoal to cook githeri, and this is the amount. And there will be a meter to actually measure the actual units. And you will see at the end of that cooking, and it takes a very short period of time, not only is the githeri tastier, but also the units that you will have used. <laughs> <laughs> the units that you will have actually used will be substantially lower, mm. and that transition is necessary. And if we can convince the public that that is the way even to mitigate against the high cost of power, they will actually be appreciating me instead of wanting to lynch me. <laughs> <laughs> I still have so many. I really do not uh, uh, agree with you about the, the cost of cooking uh, with electricity being cheaper because eh, with uh, tokens and ubanasi jokes. <laughs> Tokens me jokes, but Eric I had uh, wanted to re to jump onto your point on uh, immobility. Yeah, I think uh, it's a very interesting question. I just wanted to say this is something that a lot, almost all the countries across the globe are grappling with. So, I just remembered when we talked about this a study about Ireland. So the Irish uh, utility was doing a study, and they said if all the people in Ireland are getting e vehicle, what would it cost to the grid? to charge them all. If they start charging it when they come home and they put on their tea kettle and start cooking at five o'clock or six o'clock in the evening, they would have to double the investment. They have to build another Irish grid on top of the current one, right? Just to handle the load. If they start charging when they go to sleep at 10 and it's finished at six in the morning or five in the morning, no investment. Mm. So in fact, they get higher return on the grid they already have. So 
this is the type of considerations with the new economy, with the energy transition, we really have to think about. It's, it's not just about bringing the e-vehicles, it's about how do we use them smartly, how do we com communicate to, to consumers, and maybe how to get some price incentives in there to make that happen. Mm. <laughs> uh, Rajan, from the, uh, from the manufacturing perspective, when you look at e-mobility, e how is the Kenya manufacturing industry involved in this space? We've seen the president has been moving around with an e-vehicle, e a very small kadudu e-vehicle. <laughs> in terms of the manufacturing industry, how are you involved in that space? So, uh, thanks, Zena. I think there are two uh, areas I'm going to focus on. One is actually around the assembly of uh, automotive, uh, of motorcycles or, or boda bodas, as we say, uh, which are now going to use an uh, e-mobility as, as, as a solution. I think we already have uh, a, a vibrant uh, uh, motor, I mean, motorbike assemblers uh, in the country, and now uh, we are definitely kind of working and discussing with government how to encourage even assembly of uh, of uh, many of these e-mobile uh, vehicles rather than to bring in ready assembled vehicles. And that's what's going to create the jobs uh, in the country. And also, in addition to that, there are components of this uh, e-mobile uh, uh, vehicles that can be actually manufactured here and we can backward integrate into that. So that's, that's one space around e-mobility. And just thinking a little bit wider around e-mobility other than just the, the two villas or the three villas. I mean, I think e-mobility, once power cost comes down as well, there's a whole trend globally of how to kind of even for our logistics, because for manufacturers, they need to move their raw materials in and out and their finished goods in and out. And how can we bring the logistics cost down? Uh, through e-mobility is another area that we are looking forward to over the years. Yeah, Great. That's a great point to take another break to get to see what's coming up on the news uh, tonight, which will be hosted by James Matt. We take a quick break. We'll be right back. Benefits of ordering with Glovo. Glovo allows you to order anything you want at the comfort and convenience of your home. Craving fried chicken, or pilau, or pizza? Easy and simple. Order on Glovo today. Glovo. Order anything we deliver in minutes. With Glovo, you order anything unataka and when you get it, una celebrate because kukuchoma imefika na wakati keki nafika ndio sherei inaanza. Order Glovo will deliver in minutes. And we need two Royco cubes because iron gives you strength to skooma yourself to be the best you can be. Get ready to tantalize your taste buds and embark on a culinary journey with Pishi Bomba, the ultimate cooking show that brings the flavors of the world right into your living room. Tune in this Sunday at 6.30 p.m. with me, Claire Karatu, for a mouth-watering adventure. Pishi Bomba. Cook, eat, enjoy. Pishi Bomba in association with Ajab Home Baking Flour. Enjoy cooking your favorite meals with Ajab and freestyle your way to deliciousness. It's easy to knead, easy to roll, and quick to prepare. Ajab Home Baking Flour. The flour that does more. This is NTV. Tonight, many of our countries are headed into debt distress because of climate change. Let's be honest, we are suffering the most. Review loan rates for Africa. 
President Ruto asks lenders to reconsider loan terms. Also tonight, living beyond their means, counties on the spot for continuing to flout the law by surpassing the wage bill limits. Plus, uh, this particular sugar companies also owe GOK uh, uh, taxes uh, in terms of penalties and interest of around 50 billion shillings. Uh, and therefore, is to look at now, uh, the, the ask here is that they want the, the taxes forgiven. Sugarcane farmers call on the government to waive debts owed by millers as a way of reviving the sector. And unlocking climate financing for the continent with all due respect tonight. From Saudi Soto, and you're watching Kwetu Mix on NTV. Keep it locked, Usi Banduke. <laughs> For as low as 1.98 million Kenya shillings in Vipingo Kilifi. SMS Vipingo to 22365 or call us today on 0740-400-215. Terms and conditions apply. Welcome back. We are now in the final hours of this discussion and in this section we'd like to take a couple of questions from the audience. We have a live studio audience here at the Ministry of Energy and I'm happy to see that the people who want to ask questions are young people and I hope your questions are for the CS. <laughs> Please state your name and who you're directing your question to and keep it short. Greetings. My name is Darius Njunge, a student at Strathmore University pursuing engineering and my question is to the Cabinet Secretary. Given the increasing focus on transitioning to EV for more sustainable future, how can our country, the government, and all relevant energy stakeholders ensure that this transition is not only environmentally beneficial, but also economically inclusive for young people? Thank you. Thank you. There was somebody else. I honor the room. My name is Msita Dennis from the University of Nairobi. My question I read to the CS. Actually, I had, us, uh, I had a couple of questions, but because of time, I'll minimize the questions too. Uh, we've had uh, uh, some weeks back, we had a blackout in the country. I've heard you talking about the green uh, sources of energy. There are those people from the rural, uh, from the rural areas. So my question is... Uh, how, da, how does a lack of this reliable or the sustainable sources in rural areas impact the livelihoods of those residents? And what are the initiatives that uh, are being taken with the government maybe to help those people uh, to, uh, in considering the climate changes? Uh, the other question is, uh, in rural uh, communities, you often have unique vulnerabilities to climate change, such as the reliance on, uh, on agriculture. Uh, how are rural uh, being supported in adapting to changing climate conditions and transitioning in more sustainable, resilient energy and system to ensure that there are long-term uh, sustainability? Thank you very much. I honor the room once again. Thank you. My name is Lilian Cheptioni. 
I'm happy to be here today just to raise a few questions. And I have my son also, Leon, who is an engineer and very brilliant. He has some information about the project of the houses which they are going to build. And my question also goes to the engineer, my former colleague of Kenya Ways, of KRA, uh, uh, of, of Kenya Power. I just want to say that I live somewhere in South Sea. And especially when it's raining, we normally get, you know, you see a big fire going up. And uh, the other day I lost a relative called Benjamin Rono. Uh, he used to work for Kenya Power and he died because when they were driving, he was just going near a pole and it hit him and he, he, he died and he was buried last week. He's called Benjamin Rono. What I'm just trying to say to the engineer, can they be servicing those lines of Kenya Power? Can they be going, put your officers to be monitoring them? I live somewhere in Kabuyangek in Bomet. And at one time, somebody else also was, uh, got the same problem and he was killed. What I just want to say, put your officers to be monitoring. And sometimes you are trying to reach even your officers' numbers. They become so difficult. We've been calling sometimes even to say, we want this problem. I have my TV now. It's off because of uh, when it was raining. I just want Leon to give also the government this particular information. Leon is a very intelligent boy. Uh, he was one of the observers in the election of Ruto the other time, <laughs> our president. And he worked with CS. And Leon just come. And uh, I want Leon to take this information to, the, to give the government a knowledge which will help them also. Leon, just is, walk. Is, is it knowledge just, about... No, yeah, Leon, is come. it it's knowledge yeah, about yeah, energy? Yeah, yeah, it will help us very much. Is it about much. energy? Correct. Leon, just come in. Hi, Leon. Yo, uh, Hi, Leon. Hey, mama's boy. <laughs> Your mother speaks so highly of you. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, good evening, everybody. Yeah, my name is Leon. And... Uh, in the theme of uh, the climate summit, my question is just to our CS, Honorable Chir Chir, just to ask, uh, we have a program that we're implementing housing uh, currently and uh, under the leadership of our president. And uh, my question is, in the designs of these houses, you as the energy ministry, what steps are you taking to uh, help us better in terms of the uptake of solar uh, generation, maybe power, in those houses and future uh, generation in terms of uh, the waste that comes from these houses can produce a lot of uh, biogas that will help us to offset fossil fuel. So uh, what steps are you currently taking? Yes. Thank you, Leon. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Now I'd like to start with Engineer Siror, maybe respond to the issue of sub servicing of your lines. Thank you so much, uh, Lillian, my former colleague in Kenya Revenue Authority. Yeah, I take note of all that you have actually said, and particularly you've talked about uh, South Sea. I do know that some of the challenges that we face as a company is um, there are a number of them, and one of them is where you have a lot of encroachment onto where our lines are passing. I do know that in South Sea, at times you pass places, and the road is quite narrow, and you actually or the buildings at times come very close to even where our lines are passing. And we also face the challenge of the fact that a number of people also connect themselves illegally, and they, do, they undertake installations which are not as per standard. But I also do know that due to the expansion that I actually talked about earlier, there may be areas that we also need to look into, and I think that is one of the areas that we are looking into. Of course, one item that did possibly contribute to that is that there was a period of time where KPLC was unable to procure some of these critical materials which could actually have been used to address them. But we have taken it up in stride for the last few months that I've been there. We are really looking at all the areas where we have challenges and we are fast addressing them. So those are issues that may be temporal, but we are up to the task and we are actually going to deal with them. But we sincerely apologize for any who may have actually gotten injured as a result of some of the poor installations, which a number of times are really contributed by illegal connections, people who extend lines beyond bounds and at times do not adhere to the standards that are meant to be adhered to. But of course, when they do cause injuries, and that's actually why at times we are very tough, I do know that I had to come on live TV 
talking about the issue of illegal connections. Because at times, when these things are undertaken and people get injured, the only person they see is KPLC. They will never realize that possibly the person actually who did it was quite incompetent and should not have been doing what he was doing. But we are looking at it from all fronts, be it from those who are connecting illegally, be it from those who are just extending to connect one additional person, or be it also from those who are encroaching onto where our lines are passing, we are actually addressing all of them. But in a very short while, we shall actually be able to overcome all of them. I okay. think those are the issues yes. that you had mentioned. Yes. Thank you. Uh, Waziri, uh, the bulk of the questions were to you. And I'm glad that it's young people who asked those questions. Uh, it goes back to really the innovations that we talked about. And uh, you would want to think more of the uh, better bottom-up economic uh, frameworks that this government uh, exposes. Um, the transition is going to really create so much opportunity. Uh, because of time, we didn't talk much about clean cooking, which is an area that I did, was one of the panelists yesterday in the First Ladies uh, um, Clean Cooking Forum. And when you think about taking LPG or the cleaner transitional uh, energy to the homes, uh, you'd, you'd want to think about the distribution network. Uh, just like has been uh, asked by one of, one of the young guys, how are they going to benefit as we go EV? There are so, so many opportunities. I remember when I was growing up during the transition of the wired telecommunication to the wireless, even charging stations to charge a phone, uh, people made so much money by running a charging station. What we've done today and uh, what we've done, what we're going to do, or what we've done already is published uh, a, a time of use a tariff for electric vehicle, or, or EV for that matter. And uh, there's going to be safety. We've just talked about a safety issue where electrical energy has to be handled carefully. And when you talk about uh, taking electrical energy to the village, because vehicles are all over the country, they are in rural areas, you do not want people hooking up and burning the same vehicle that they're supposed to be charging uh, by shooting and uh, destroying an, uh, uh, a whole investment. Mm -hmm. So uh, with the charging stations, we do see the gas stations today, the petrol stations, most of them converting, having uh, a transitional process of a, a, fueling, a fueling side of the station with some defined distances by regulation on how far will you have the electrical energy for charging your vehicles. We do see charging happening. Uh, you, you can drive up country and find that you need to come back to Nairobi and you don't have a, your, your battery has run down, you need to charge. So there'll be so many opportunities from uh, charging uh, the e-mobility systems to running a swapping station, because you can imagine if a border board arrives uh, at your station and uh, he's having a passenger or delivering a, a pizza, he cannot wait for two hours to charge his battery. So you can have uh, a stack of some 200 batteries. You basically, and, and they subscribe to you because you, you can be, the association of uh, border border association that run even in the villages is so organized and uh, they've done even the funding of how they buy this border border. So you can imagine, if I arrive and I pick a battery, plug it in and leave you one to charge and move on. So there'll be investment opportunities in really running a station for uh, charged or rather fully charged batteries which are exchangeable and therefore we do not, you, the, 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 the border border rider does not have to wait for them. Mm -hmm. So those kind of opportunities are going to arise. Um, certainly it's a, new, it's a new front. I'm sure there'll be so many interesting uh, secondary opportunities that will arise and I can assure you we'll be supporting um, the transition to ensure that our youths do benefit. As regarding uh, the question of um, the, the climate change and uh, the investments that come with it in terms of uh, are we going to destroy, how are we going to secure our environments as we do this? And then certainly, like I did mention yesterday, safe energy, clean energy is energy which is not generated. I'm happy today, Rajan, 
is sitting here running a program he did mention called uh, Energy Efficiency System. And what we will be seeking to do is to make sure that we do run these programs and only ensure that we cut cost of energy, like I mentioned earlier, by not generating what we do not have to generate. Because even when we generate uh, geothermal solar, and when you have gone to Olkaria, we destroy the environment. It, 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 it's, not, it's not really, the environment is hurt. When we build a road, an environment, the environment is destroyed. What we're destroying as we build new systems are good carbon sinks. When you fell a tree, a trees are, good, are known to be very good carbon sinks. And therefore, we'll work and ensure that even as we go through the transition, uh, when we lay solar panels, you can be sure that uh, those solar panels are in the area for one megawatt of power, I think we do about uh, an acre, one point, maybe an hectare. An hectare is covered, and so there's no greenery mm. in where you're generating power. Mm. So we'll be conscious as we go green to ensure that even that greening of the environment through energy generation does not destroy the vegetation mm. and is environmentally friendly. When you go to Alcaria today, you'll realize that the steam collection, collecting, what do you call it, the, the steam system uh, is being painted green to look like the environment because Alcaria is within the wildlife area and you would like to maintain the ambience of the wildlife so that you also maintain the friendly environment for the animals who coexist within the generation centers. Mm. I, I don't know whether I've covered that well. Uh, the question was a bit abstract. Okay. Uh, you can have a chat with him after this, before he leaves. But there's a question for, for Eric here. Um, the Ukraine-Russia war and the impact it's had on logistics and currency fluctuations. In light of all that, what is the forecast uh, consideration for implementing innovative solutions? Can, can you cover the second part again? The, co the cost considerations uh, when implementing innovative solutions in light of the Ukraine-Russia war. Yeah, so I think that the Ukraine-Russia war is, has emphasized the, the vulnerability of global, you know, value chains, such as, you know, both in terms of food imports and in terms of energy imports, right? So I think part of this we see at the pump, part of it we see when we go to the grocery store. And I think the lessons a lot of countries l draw from this is that we need to increase our energy independence. We need to strengthen our agriculture in this country and in many others. And uh, so, so the resilience, which is a fine word for talking about the impact of climate, it also affects, uh, you know, adapts to, to other crises. I also wanted to say on, on the issue of youth and jobs, which are great questions, by the way, uh, we have a lot to do also in supporting communities in Kenya that are newly electrified. When you look at the demand uh, for energy in these uh, towns and villages that have just received electricity, it's often almost all for lighting. And we need to be better to stimulate job creation, innovators, as you mentioned, uh, refrigeration for our agricultural product, uh, solar pumping for irrigation, you name it. And I think, so there's a huge untapped potential and all you innovators out there, come with ideas. Uh, Rajan, when we live here, what would you like us to remember about manufacturing and energy and climate change? So when, when it comes to energy, I think as a manufacturer, the most important uh, issue is that we need to be globally competitive. And, and as a result of that, our, our, our cry still remains that how we can bring that uh, down to a globally competitive level, the cost of energy, so that the output that the manufacturer produces can be also uh, globally competitive so that we can actually be able to export to, uh, to the markets that we are have, having access to. Uh, but there's also one other thing I just want to allude to in terms of uh, jobs and the youth. Mm -hmm. And there's some, uh, there's, and I believe that in Kenya we have a very innovative uh, in terms of from a, uh, from a ICT point of view. And we have not spoken about carbon credits. And this is one area which I feel that our youth uh, can play a very significant role here in terms of how can 
we sequester uh, carbon credit and then be able to, and, and use technology on how we can trade. And I think our new amended Climate Change Act is mm -hmm. going to give those opportunities to this youth as well. Mm. Thank you. You mentioned carbon credits. That's a very emotive subject. There are people who believe carbon credits are basically greenwashing, giving uh, uh, rich countries the license to, to emit, and therefore poor countries such as Kenya should not be involving themselves in such discussions. Uh, but I'd like to thank all of you for making time for this conversation. I know there are still more questions, but uh, our, our panelists can still be available for another 10 or so minutes. You can ask your questions off air. Uh, but right now, we need to make room for NTV tonight. I'd like to thank Engineer Sirol for making time to be with us today, uh, CS Chirchir, uh, Rajan Shah of the Kenya Association of Manufacturers, as well as Eric Farnstrom from the World Bank for making time for this conversation, as well as you, the live audience here at the Ministry of Energy headquarters. We can still continue this conversation online, uh, hashtag Nation Leadership Forum at NTV Kenya at Zainu Andati. And let's keep engaging about uh, the impacts of climate change on the energy industry and how you as a young innovator can be facilitated to bring your innovation on grid. My name is Zainab Andati. Do not go away. NTV Tonight with James Smart is coming right up.